My name is Taylor Lovett. I am the director of web engineering for a company called TenUp. I'm a WordPress plugin creator and core contributor and an open source community member. Just a quick plug before I get started. TenUp, as always, is hiring. C is tenuphiring.com. Um, we work with a lot of really cool clients. We're a distributed web agency. We are hiring engineers, JavaScript people, PHP people, designers, project managers, everything. Um, so if you like anything that I talked about today and you want to work with any of those clients, please see me after. So before approaching how we build web websites for enterprise, I think we should probably define what is enterprise. And I think this, this term means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so I'm going to run through some traits, which I think many of which are, are probably true for, for most enterprise organizations. So to start, the obvious one is, is traffic. So websites receiving millions of page views per day are ones that I would consider to be enterprise. Websites producing high dollar revenues. Websites worked on by large teams. So, so I think organizations that have a, a large team and, and a large amount of stakeholders involved in, in a web property, that, that can sort of constitute this, this enterprise definition. Websites providing critical time-sensitive data. Websites involving many complex integrations. And what I mean by that is like lots of third-party APIs and um, stuff like that. So kind of the bottom line is, whatever, whatever, however you want to define enterprise, large organizations and high dollar business objectives require that no matter what, that websites are performant, efficient, scalable, maintainable, uh, definitely highly available, data centric, and of course, scalable. That was a mouthful. Here's a, a bunch of websites that are actually running WordPress. I'm sure you, you know some of these are, are running WordPress, like the, the obvious ones like TechCrunch and, and Variety and the New York Times. but. These, these other organizations are also running WordPress in, in some form. So pretty cool, huh? Um, I think, just a side note, WordPress you know, is, is doing a lot of growing up in the past couple of years. And, and the platform traditionally started, as, as we all know, as a blogging platform, but it has, been, has grown to be much more. And, and you see these WordPress talks at, at WordCamps about um, you know, WordPress as a framework and all this stuff. And WordPress is, in my opinion, a fully full, fully fledged framework and is fully capable of, of powering, you know, any of the biggest websites in the world. So anyways, um, like I said, I work for a company called TenUp. The top of this slide is cut off, unfortunately, so you can't see the top. But um, these are our best practices. And we open sourced them, I would say, about a year and a half ago. And they cover um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, um, how we structure our like, themes and, and files and stuff like that to the tools we use, the frameworks, um, how we version control. This, 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 lays, this is a blueprint of how we build websites for enterprise to 10 up. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about today are, are things that are pulled directly from this. So anyone, any WordPress developer in this room, whether advanced or, or more junior, I would highly encourage you to check out these best practices. And like I said, they're open source. So if, if you think you know, we should be doing something differently or something's not right, create a pull request. So first thing I want to talk about is caching. Redis, so we use Redis as a persistent object cache. Um, many of you probably know WordPress. Is, is sort of caching agnostic. You can drop in your own custom object cache. Um, I, I would say memcache is probably the most popular thing that people use for that nowadays. Um, we like Redis. Basically, it basically lets you store things in memory so you can quickly read and, and write to, to those caching buckets. Um, I think Redis offers a lot of built-in features that, that memcache doesn't, specifically around failover. So when it comes to, to building like a serious cluster for enterprise on the, on the systems level, Redis works for us. Um, and I have a link down below, which is cut off, unfortunately. Um, side note, my slides are at taylorlovett.com. So if anybody wants to follow along, feel free to, to do so. Um, there's a, a WordPress plugin called WP Redis. So that's, that's the drop-in you can use to, to connect your WordPress site to Redis. Page caching. So page caching is the act of caching entire HTML outputs or page pages into an object cache. So in this case, it would be Redis. Um, and then rather than having to do all the database queries and all the crazy PHP stuff, we can just say, is this request one that we've seen before? If so, then let's go directly to the object cache and pull that entire um, 
HTML generated HTML um, piece of cache out. So page caching is something that we use heavily to to make websites scale and and run when they're being viewed million times millions of times a day. Um, so I would highly utilize page caching as much as possible. Obviously, like when you get into like personalization and community type sites, you have to get clever and use JavaScript and do all sorts of tricks and you may or may not be able to use this, but generally speaking, page caching is the way to go. And I have a link below to the bat cache plugin, thank you, which is uh, Automatic's page, page caching plugin that they actually use on WordPress.com, so check that out. Fragment caching, similar to page caching, except we're just going to uh, cache snippets of HTML on the page or, or maybe an object that was generated on the page. Um, generally, the way we word this in our best practices is anything on the front end involving a database read, like a WP query thing, you should um, save the HTML, cache it, and then output that later. Um, and a good example, this is like a post carousel, like a featured post carousel, like rather than running through that WP query every time the page loads to, to pull those posts out, like do it once, cache it for a certain amount of time, and um, just pull from the cache. So that it's, it's much faster that way. Remote calls, uh, a remote call is like using the WP remote request function. So any call to a third party API, any, any call that's blocking, those can be huge performance bottlenecks. And this is something I see in a lot of community plugins that um, on every page load, like they're sending some sort of request to a third party API and it's making your website run slowly. So cache remote calls as long as possible if you have to make them. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but the WP remote request function lets you make non-blocking requests. So if you don't need to wait for your request, you can set it that way and it won't stop the you know PHP from continuing to execute. This is a pretty cool one. So priming cache asynchronously. Um, if a user hits your page and you have something that needs to be generated on the fly and then cached, there are better strategies for doing that such that you can do that asynchronously. So maybe when a user visits the page and the cache is stale, show them the old cache and then send out like an Ajax request which sets up like a cron job to prime that same cache bucket um, asynchronously so the user doesn't have to wait. Um, so you can get really, really clever with stuff like this to, to just keep performance super, super high. This is a really common one. Um, admin Ajax.php is, is for admin, admin use only. It is not cached as aggressively as, as stuff on the front end. Page caching on it won't work at all. So if you have a website on your home page and it, you have it set up all real nice with page caching and you're really confident and you start making admin Ajax requests, um, you're hitting an uncached endpoint every single time you do that. So um, obviously I have the JSON REST API. If you do need to make Ajax calls, do so on a cached endpoint and, and the JSON REST API would, would work with that. Um, so at 10 up, a little bit opinionated, but off the shelf caching plugins, we, we don't really use them. The ones that we use are, are bat cache and we use the, the Redis drop in. Um, a lot of these off-the-shelf caching plugins can be very difficult to install um, and even more difficult to remove, and there's a lot of horror stories with, with stuff like that. Um, generally, these plugins are they're created for public use, and thus they have like 8 million features and you only need like two of them. Um, try to keep it simple. If you're building a website for enterprise, you probably have the budget to, to really think about what you're trying to do and do it effectively rather than throwing like, you know, some huge bloated plugin at it. So let's talk about database reads and writes. Um, a general rule, you should avoid front-end writes. Database writes in general are slow with MySQL. Um, front-end writes can cause race conditions. Page, if you're using any sort of page caching, then a front-end write may or may not happen because if your page is cached, then that front-end write isn't, isn't going to execute. Um, if you really need to write data on the front-end, use some sort of AJAX request. WP query is pretty much the, the way in WordPress to pull content out of the database. Um, and if anybody's seen the WP query codex, it's, it's massive and there's a lot to learn. I'm just going to touch on a few parameters for WP query to make your queries much more performant. Um, 
one of the biggest ones is no found rows. So if you set no found rows to true in your query, that will tell WordPress not to pass that SQL calc found rows thing into the query. And basically what that does is if you're doing a limited query, SQL calc found rows will be able to determine the total number of pages in your query. Um, so if you're not doing pagination, then you do not need to do that. And that will make your query much more performant. Um, update post meta cache, update term cache, set those to false. If you're not going to be using terms or posts, post meta, um, they're going to have to, to blast through cache and, and you probably don't need that. Um, if you're only needing the post ID, you can set fields to IDs and this will make your query much faster. Post per page, do not set post, post per page to negative one. That's just asking for trouble. Um, something like that on the front of a web page, if there was too many posts, could, could take down a website very easily. So I would recommend setting post per page to a reasonable number. Um, and finally, don't use post not in. This tells MySQL to run a not in query, which is just inherently inefficient to MySQL. Here's just a quick example. So new WP query, we have no found rows, fields, IDs. Um, we're not updating post meta or term cache, and we're setting a, a reasonable upper limit for our posts to, to 100. A lesser known sort of performance thing, um, auto loading. So update option and add option take a third parameter, and that is the auto load parameter. Um, by default, options are auto loaded in WordPress, meaning on every page load, WordPress is going to bootstrap those options on the page in case you want to use them. But if you're setting something in the options table that you're not going to need on every single page load, then set auto load to false, and that will give you a performance boost. Okay. So browser performance, um, CDNs, very, very important. So uh, content delivery networks, they enable you to serve static assets um, from servers other than your own, so your servers don't get blasted. And when you use some of these big CDN networks, you can, you know, they have servers all over the world, so you can serve those assets in locations that are closer to your visitors. Um, so they have huge, huge performance benefits on the front end. And I don't want to recommend any specific one because I think needs really, really vary from project to project. So reduce the number and size of HTTP requests. This is one of the biggest reasons why front end websites are, are running slowly. Um, we try to minify all JavaScript and CSS files, concaten can, sorry, concatenate all JavaScript and CSS files, um, optimize images. And I have HTTP2 question mark because that's a really, really cool way to reduce the number of requests. Um, we use Grunt. WordPress core uses Grunt. There's a lot of opinions on this. Most, most of them outside of the WordPress community on, on different um, build runners. We like Grunt and it works well for us. Okay, so maintainability and stability. So at 10up, we build a lot of big projects for a lot of big websites, um, and we find that maintainable code improves stability. So code that is, is maintainable and extendable are less susceptible to bugs. I also think that bugs in maintainable and extendable code bases are solved quicker. Um, and of course, as well, new features are added more easily to code bases that, that are written well and are maintainable. And the final one, which I think is really cool, is, is happy engineers are more productive. And we all know, like as developers, it's, it's just it's so hard jumping into a code base that is not maintainable and is messy. And it just it puts frown, frowny faces on, on everybody. So, <laughs> um, so modern PHP design patterns. WordPress gets a lot of flack outside of, the, outside of our community for being backwards compatible backwards compatible all the way to PHP 5.2.4 because everybody wants to use the latest, coolest stuff in PHP, which like as a developer, I totally get that. Um, but I, I think a lot of them don't realize that when you're maintaining your own web server, um, especially for an enterprise client, which you probably have a, you know, a pretty complex setup, you can control whatever versions of languages you want. You want to run PHP 7, you want to run like the latest PHP build or whatever, like Go ahead and, you know, you can do that. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can do it. So 
use the cool features in PHP that we have available to us. Um, namespaces, traits, composer, you use all that like cool new stuff. Developers like it. It's going to make um, iterations on your code base quicker. Like that stuff's great. At the end of the day, you can't, I mean, you can, but you probably don't want to distribute that to like the WordPress.org plugins or themes repository because that actually is meant to be compatible back to PHP 5.2. But use that on your own projects. Use that on your client websites. This one's slightly opinionated. Um, don't obsess over MVC and PHP. So if, in this context, MVC is model, view, and controller. Um, it's a really awesome pattern. It works really well for a lot of frameworks that, that aren't WordPress. Um, WordPress is it's just not an object-oriented platform. Um, and we find that forcing MVC with tools like Twig and these other things um, ultimately just lead to more confusing code and make it hard for, harder for new developers to come onto a project and, and understand what's going on. Um, working at a, a big agency like 10up and building enterprise-level websites, we have huge teams of engineers. Um, and with huge teams means that people are going to be coming on and off the project. So if you build a website in such a way that only five people in the world understand it, and it takes like three months for, for anyone to wrap their head around your code base, um, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. So, so we have to build code that, that people can understand easily. JavaScript. So there's been a lot of JavaScript talk at the conference. Um, all this stuff is great. Modern JavaScript design patterns. Um, Common JS, not only ES6, but you can use ES7. Um, use stuff like Webpack and Browserify to, to package up your JavaScript and make it um, compatible in, in some, some of the older versions of browsers. We think that grouping distinct pieces of functionality into plugins is a great move. It lets us use those plugins elsewhere. Um, and it also makes deployments a lot simpler because when we have code broken out into, into distinct repositories and distinct areas, if we iterate on one feature, we can deploy that feature without having to like deploy the entire website with all the things. Um, so this, this workflow really works for us. Um, documentation is super important for keeping a, a code base maintainable. Um, as developers, like I know I have a tendency to just tear through code and not want to document things and, and hate myself afterwards, but um, we, we all need to, to work together to document the code that we're writing, um, especially working on a project with a huge team of people where you're not going to be the only one looking at that code. Um, documentation is super important. Um, so at TenUp, we actually make documentation part of our code review process which I'm going to talk about later. So I have the PHP documentation standards there from, from uh, WordPress Make, and I also have the, the JavaScript documentation standards. This, this one is one of my personal favorites, um, wrapping wrappers. WordPress has a really awesome, rich, easy to use API that lets you create post types and insert posts and create meta boxes and send HTTP requests and do all this magical, all these magical things. Um, as developers, personally speaking, especially like when, when I'm newer, like for whatever reason, it, it strikes me that creating these complex wrapper classes um, to wrap up functionality, existing functionality that's in WordPress can seem appealing. Um, but we find that, that creating these wrappers around existing APIs more often than not just makes the code more confusing. It adds another library that you may need to maintain. And then whenever you bring somebody else in the project, now instead of learning this, like, this API that WordPress already has, they have to learn the API that you built around the API. So something to think about. Testing code. So automated tests are, are crucial. Uh, we use PHP unit for PHP, just like WordPress core. Um, there's the core unit testing framework, and there's also WP Mock, which is a 10-up project. Check out that GitHub link. We use Mocha for JavaScript, um, which is one of the newer JavaScript testing frameworks that's gotten a lot of popularity and is very easy to use. And something really cool, which I just popped into the slides last second, is Codeception for acceptance test. Um, and we've actually open sourced a Codeception WPCLI wrapper, so you can scaffold out Codeception tests. And that's by um, a developer of ours named Eugene Manilov. This is really cool, what, what we're doing with Codeception. Um, 
this is just a code snippet from one of my um, my form plugins that I that I have for free in the .org repository. And what this just does, it's it's the code speaks for itself. But basically, the test puts you on an admin page, clicks a link, um, and then you know either I see or don't see, and, and makes assertions that way. So if if after this is this actually tests a JavaScript modal. So clicking add form opens up a JavaScript modal. Um, and then, you know, after clicking that special fields thing, you're not supposed to see single line of text and you're supposed to see this and, and you can do a lot of really fancy things with, with testing, um, complex JavaScript interactions and, and complex, um, applications. So code is really cool. I have the GitHub link down there again for scaffolding tests for WordPress. So check that out. Security. So this is a big one. Um, it's absolutely critical that the websites we build for enterprises are secure. Um, and one of the biggest parts of this is making sure that we clean input. So validate or sanitizing data. We need to validate and sanitize all data that's being inserted in the database to make sure there's nothing harmful. Quick code snippet. Um, when updating PostMeta, we're, we're using this sanitize text field WordPress function to sanitize a, a post variable. Um, very similar rather than we're, we're validating in the, in the next example. So if an option is posted, we're just, we're setting true into meta. And if it's not posted, then we're just deleting the post meta rather than setting false. So that's an example of validation. We also need to secure all output. So anything that's being outputted to the screen should be escaped. Um, we practice late escaping. The WordPress codex has this, this whole library of escaping functions that you can check out. And I have a link in the slides. Quick code example. So we're getting something from PostMeta and we're outputting it to the screen and we're using that escape HTML function and we're just echoing that. And then in the second example, we're, we're again getting something from PostMeta and we're echoing it using escape attribute. And that's making sure that whatever is being pulled from the database is safe to be on the screen and isn't like some sort of nasty JavaScript. So this is an important one and one that I think is often overlooked. Inner HTML and jQuery selectors, you can do some dangerous things with those. Um, you do not want to insert arbitrary data into, into inner HTML or jQuery selectors. Um, like I said, you can do some dangerous things through J jQuery selectors. You can actually create elements on the DOM, so you can execute ar arbitrary JavaScript through jQuery selectors. Same thing with inner HTML. So rather than using those two things, um, in the first example, we're, we're getting this um, class name from the DOM, and rather than using inner HTML, we're using inner text and setting it to our, our arbitrary text string. Um, and then in the second example, where we need to insert HTML into the DOM, we are, we are actually using the create element function and creating a div, then using inner text to set the, the inside of that div to this arbitrary text string, and then we're appending that node to the DOM. So that's a safe way to add HTML to the DOM without using inner text, or inner HTML, sorry. So nonces, nonces help you ensure the intent of actions. Um, so anything, any sort of like database modification should always have a nonce to ensure that the user is actually intending to do what, what they're supposed to, to be doing. Um, and WordPress provides some functions to do that. WP create nonce, WP verify nonce, and WP nonce field. Just a quick example. Um, we're setting up the nonce with WP nonce field. And then whatever action is being performed, when it's being performed, we're verifying that that, that nonce is valid. We encourage limiting login attempts, so this can help avoid a lot of attacks in brute force type situations. You know, come up with an, an upper limit on the reasonable number of attempts, attempts that somebody should be able to, to fail their password on. And requiring strong passwords, so weak passwords are, are one of the most common exploits that, that people get in through. Um, so a good, good sort of best practice is to require users to create strong passwords. Okay, so third-party code. We review every single line of code that we push to a client site. Um, there are over 40,000 community plugins. Um, plugins are reviewed when they're submitted to the WordPress.org database. Revisions are not. 
And the review guidelines for those plugins are, aren't really geared toward enterprise, and they're not really looking for like super important performance things. Um, same thing with themes. There's thousands of community themes. They have a little bit more stringent of guidelines than plugins, um, but the review guidelines are not geared to, to enterprise. So at 10up, code review is a very, very important part of our workflow. We, um, we review every line of code that we push to a client. We also review third-party plugins and themes if, if we use them. Understanding your library, very, very important. Um, jQuery and underscores, they're great tools. All these cool JavaScript libraries are great. But if you're using a library and you don't really understand how it works, um, that can lead to bad results in the end if that library changes. So we encourage people to, to have a real understanding of the libraries they're using and to actually have an understanding of vanilla JavaScript, which is very important. And I'm, I'm moving a little bit quickly because I'm running low on time. Sorry. So workflows, keeping track of code history with, with something like Git is absolutely important, and I'm sure everybody knows that. Making sure to use descriptive commit messages. You can see how our workflow works exactly in the best practices, and it goes into detail. Um, we're basically using a modified version of, of the Git flow workflow. I mentioned we do code reviews. We actually do peer code reviews, so we have engineers re review each other's code, um, and sometimes we have sort of like engineering managers review their, their code as well. Um, but code reviews help ensure performance, security, maintainability, and scalability. And that is all I have, so let's do questions. I know there's at least one. Uh, so as, as you implement um, additional practices, for example, further QA or code review processes, obviously this adds a lot more time into your development cycle. How do you approach the addition of these while trying to meet deadlines which were maybe met, you know, agreed to previously? Great question. I think as we've matured as an organization, that's stuff that we account for in the sales process. So generally, we're not going to sell a project if we can't deliver a solid project. I mean, there are times where client you know needs shift, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, we need to deliver this much faster. Um, sometimes we have to make tough decisions, but I think at the end of the day, like there's always time to do a code review. Like maybe maybe the code review is not as thorough, maybe the QA is not as thorough, but there's always time to do something, and making sure the clients understand the risks in deploying earlier than than we might be comfortable with, and making sure they sign off on those risks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, on a similar note, how do you handle clients who are maybe enterprise level, and you pitch them some of the things like, hey, we want to roll unit testing in, and they say we don't want to have the budget for that, or you know we don't think that's necessary. Um, how do you kind of sell them to get on board with everything? Right. Great question. Certain things we, we push harder than others. Unit testing is one of those things where if clients don't want unit tests, it, it really depends on the project. We will try to sell them on it. Um, if it's a much larger scale project and we actually think it'll save us time in the long run, we might just write unit tests and not even include it in part of the sales process because we know at the end of the day it's going to help us, you know, do better on the project. So really, really depends on the project, but yeah, great question. Anybody else? Is that, is that a question, Paul? What are some of your favorite tools for linting code and measuring code quality? <laughs> um, well, PHP code sniffer, of course, for PHP, and I guess JS lint for for JavaScript. Great question. Those are personal favorites. One more time for one more question, if there is one. I think there's one more. All right, this is uh, fairly specific to uh, my personal situation. Um, our company is just cutting our teeth right now on 
I wouldn't say that it's up to the, the levels of what you're defining enterprise up here, but um, we're dealing for the first time with a WordPress site where there's a ton of people logged in all the time. And a lot of these, um, a lot of tips that I'm seeing and best practices apply often to serving up content on the front end. And we're struggling really hard to have our sites scale um, and have it not get totally bogged down by tons of administrators and people logged in on the back end. Do you have any tips? Yeah. Um, first of all, if you haven't already, update to PHP 7, which is supposed to give you like out of the box a massive performance boost. Um, try using something like MariaDB, which is just like a drop in replacement for MySQL, which is supposed to give you, I don't know, like 5% and improve performance on MySQL. Um, and then I would look at the plugins that you're, that you're using and, and what exactly you know is happening code-wise. Use something like Xdebug and, and I don't know, like Q, Q Cache Grind to, to really find out where, like, where the users are getting bogged down in the code. And if it's truly that you just have a lot of users, then you need to up your, you know, your system resources. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.